Good evening. Uh, my name is David Pachta, and I am a PhD student studying spirituality here at the Oblate School of Theology. And on behalf of the staff, faculty, board, and administration, I want to welcome you to the second lecture in our series from Willpower to Grace, Overcoming Addiction, Obsession, and Resentment. Do we have any first timers here this week? Anyone that missed last week? All right, welcome. It's great to have you if you're here for your first time. And if you need to know where the bathrooms are, just walk that way when you go out the door. Um, also, we wanted to make you aware that there's a really special event happening this coming weekend. I'm sorry, not this weekend, the following weekend. And that is a Bernie McGinn conference in honor of Bernard, Bernard McGinn. On Friday night, there will be a free lecture by David Tracy, who's one of, he's a world-renowned theologian from Chicago, and he will be giving a lecture on Friday night that's open to the public, so you're welcome to attend. If you're interested in the whole conference, just go to our website, and you can find details on the website. As with last week, we will take a short break at around the hour mark, at which time you will find some light refreshments outside in the hallway, and after the break, we'll reconvene here for the rest of the presentation and open the floor up to questions. We'll end our time together about 9 p.m. tonight. But before we get started, I'd like to ask you to take out your cell phones and pass them to the front. I'm just kidding. Um, just make sure that they're on silent so that they don't disturb the lecture uh, or vibrate. That would be great. Um, if you're here tonight, most likely you already know all about Father Ron Rollheiser. He is our president here at the school. And he is a, an author and a highly sought after speaker. It's really a pleasure to be able to have him right here at home in San Antonio. I do have a warning for you tonight. When I met Ron two years ago, I had an established well-paying career. Now I have no job and I am a full-time student as his lectures and his writings inspired me to further study. So be careful when you attend Ron's lectures. Um, no, I actually, I have such a deep respect for him and all the work that he has done for God's people. It is my honor to introduce him. Please join me in welcoming Father Ron to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Sound is good. Actually, I want to reiterate what, what David said about uh, the Bernie McGinn Seminar. As you know, Bernie McGinn, or maybe you don't know, Bernie McGinn is probably the major English writer in spirituality of the last generation. You know, um, taught at the University of Chicago, and he's retiring, so we're going to have a special farewell party kind of symposium for him here. We're going to have a lot of famous theologians here on Friday night, which is the 12th or 13th, I forget, I think it's the 12th. Um, we're going to have David Tracy uh, lecture here. David Tracy, if you ask, the, who are the most, the fam most famous five theologians of the last 60 years in English language? He's one of them. Taught at the University of Chicago. I can't fully guarantee that you'll understand him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but sometimes he can be understandable, but he's, he's truly a great mind. So, and, and that's free, as are all the public lectures. Sandra Schneiders will be given one of them. Philip Sheldrake from our own faculty will be giving one of them. So um, check our website, it's a major event. Okay, we're here for our second evening and uh, make sure this all changes. Okay. Uh, and and la last week we looked at, well the overall title, an anthropology of willpower and grace, our struggle for radical sobriety and last week I looked at, a, at a, a spirituality of willpower and grace. And this week I want to look at a anthropology of willpower and grace. And next week we're going to look at radical sobriety and how you get there. Now, what do I mean by an anthropology of willpower and grace? Okay. You know, usually when we think of, for instance, grace, we always think of it in a church sense, sanctifying grace, actual grace, all these graces and so on. Um, and, and the same with willpower. Tonight I want to situate them just kind of naturally, okay? 
Um, I want to situate, how does willpower work? How does it set into our nature? What are its ups and its downs? And then also, what is natural, which really is natural grace? Okay. Um, and I want to begin uh, with, with, a, with, a, with a certain okay, definition of willpower, and, and then we're, we're going to go into the anthropology of willpower. Willpower, quite simply, is if you look up in the dictionary, it's simply our innate capacity to actualize our choices. You know, which is interesting, psychologically, is up for grabs. You know, a lot of the great psychologists of our century, including B.F. Skinner and so on, they're no lightweights. They'd say, we don't really have freedom. Freedom is a, it's a misnomer. They said, we, we don't, we, 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 most people never act freely in their lives that we're a product of our biology, of our sociology, of circumstance, and so on. And that, you know, it sounds far-fetched, but it isn't. You know, sometimes you get to be 40 or 50 years old, or 60, and you look back in your life and say, did I really choose all this stuff? Did I choose to get married at 18? Did I know what I was doing, and so on? And you realize that your freedom <laughs> wasn't all that free. Remember, there's a, a great old movie, which is still worth watching, called Cool Hand Luke. Remember that? And um, Paul Newman plays Cool Hand Luke, and he's kind of this drifter, loser. At one point, he's just drunk on a Saturday night, and he starts cutting off parking meters, just cutting them off and laying them on the ground, and he gets arrested. And he's in front of the judge. The judge said, young man, he said, what were you thinking about? He said, that's just colossally stupid. Like, why would anybody do this? What were you thinking about? And Paul Newman says, your Honor, I wasn't thinking at all. That's the whole problem. <laughs> okay. okay. A lot of times we think we're actualizing ourselves, and later on we realize we aren't at all. Okay. So that um, the strength just to carry out our wishes and our desires. Now, I want to situate that. Now, anthropological means just naturally. We're not talking theology here tonight. It, it, and that is situating willpower within, the co within a complex nature, and an unchosen existential. I'm sure you're just waiting to hear those words, the unchosen existential. You know, we make a very dis important distinction in academics and theology between what we call nature and the, your existential situation. And it's this. Nature is who you are, you know? And you're born, and you're a man or a woman. You're born with human nature, and that's common to everybody. You know, whether you're born a man or a woman here or in Bangladesh or any place in the world, if you're born a baptized a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or an atheist and so on, you know, your, your manliness, your womanliness, your human nature, it's the same. Today we use the expression, you got the same hardware as everybody else, you know. But you don't live in an abstract. There is no such thing as a man or a woman. There's only a man or a woman living in Bangladesh living in, you know, Cactus Lake, Saskatchewan, living in San Antonio, living in Philadelphia, living, you know, who, who's Hispanic, who's this, who's English, who's German, or whatever. See, we're born, nobody's, nobody's abstract. We're, we live in a situation, you know. All of you came, came, came here tonight, you're all men and women, you're, we've all have the same humanity, but you came from, we've all grown up in different backgrounds, and that's your existential, you know. We're human beings, and you're going to see that nature itself is already very complex, but we're also inside of an existential, and both of them are going to severely limit our freedoms. They're going to impact very heavily on our choices and our willpower, and so on. That, um, you know, for instance, today they have sophisticated studies on this, and for instance, of the sociology of poverty, the sociology of gender, of so on and so on. Um, why does it happen that so many times if um, you're growing up in a certain situation, you end up exactly like your parents did, you know? Um, not always, but oftentimes, see, if you grow in a situation of poverty, there's a good chance you may end up in poverty, you know? Um, why? See, your nature is the same, but you're in a di that's your situation. It impacts heavily and so on. Now, I'm going to look at them separately. I want to look, first of all, at our nature, the complexity that comes along um, with your nature. 
You know, one of the things where I think spirituality has failed us, particularly in Roman Catholicism, but in all Christianity, and it's this, that too often, if I can switch theologically for a second, we've been taught kind of that life is supposed to be simple and you're supposed to be simple and that somehow you can simply follow God and obey the commandments and do all this stuff as if it's all that simple, that's not doing you a favor, you know. All of us are horrifically complex. There isn't one of us in this room who couldn't write two books on abnormal psychology. <laughs> and that's just getting in touch with yourself. You know, I grew up in, in Saskatchewan prairies. And, you know, it, it, if you ever saw a little house in the prairies, that's kind of the way I grew up. Except little house in the prairies is very idealistic. And I remember we'd always get these wonderful parish priests who'd come to our little town. And they'd come in and the parish priests come in and they'd say, you know, it's just so wonderful being with you simple farm folk. God, it's going to be great being here. And I thought, he watched too many episodes of Little Louse in the Prairies, you know. <laughs> you know why? There are no simple farm folk, because there are no simple folk. Our little community, we had all the problems you have every other place. We had health breakdowns and marriage breakdowns and suicides and people going berserk and people just barely hanging on and so on, because we're all really complex. And that complexity comes from what's best in us. You know, as Christians, let me just switch to Christianity and I'm going to take this out after, I mean, in, in human terms afterwards. We say that, you know, what is your deepest identity? What is your deepest identity as a person that constitutes your nature? And it's this. We say we're made in the image and likeness of God. We are made in the image and likeness of God, but we over -ideally idealize that. So somehow you think, you say, what does it mean to you that you're made in image and likeness of God? We somehow think there's this beautiful icon stamped into your soul that, you know, you, you have this beautiful God-likeness. That may be true, but God is fire and God is infinity. And so we have inside of us divine fire, divine infinity, which doesn't make easy peace with this life. You know, inside of all of us, if you're a woman, there's a goddess inside of you. If you're a man, there's a God inside of you. And that infinity just does not make easy peace with this life. You are just overwired for this life. You know, um, Augustine put this so famously in his famous line. He said, you've made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And they aren't just restless. They're also really complex. Remember the great line you have in Robert Bolt's famous thing, um, on Thomas Moore, um, a man for all seasons. At one time, Thomas Moore tells his daughter, he says, he says, Margaret, he says, God made animals and plants to serve him the simplicity of their being. But he made human beings <clears throat> to serve him, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in the infinite complexity and uncanny reaches of their mind. You know, animals and plants are made simple. We aren't. In fact, they aren't that simple either. You know, we just read in our, in our liturgies the last couple of weeks of the, the weekday liturgies, the book of Koheleth, Ecclesiastes. And you have that famous text that Peter Seeger made famous with the song, There is a Season, a Time to be Born, a Time to Die. You all know that one? Okay. Now, it's interesting. We always quit reading that text too soon. So Koheleth, and Koheleth literally, Hebrew means the preacher. The preacher says... Okay, so the preacher says there's a time for everything. He said there's a time to be born, time to die, time to live, time to grow, time to plant, time to harvest, a time to do this, time to do that. And he contrasts these wonderful, says the 14 opposites. There's a season in your life for everything, <clears throat> but we stop reading too soon because he's only building to what he wants to say. He says, God has made everything beautiful in its own time. God has made everything beautiful in its own season, but God has put timelessness into the human heart. So the human heart is out of sync with everything from the beginning to the end. It's quite a line. God has made everything beautiful in its own season, but God has put timelessness into your heart so that you are out of sync with the seasons from beginning to end. You know, nature has this beautiful rhythm. Spring, summer, winter, fall. 
baby calves are born and they grow into cattle and they have baby calves and the cycle of life goes on and it's all beautiful except you haven't fit from the day you've been born. You know, little little humor in that. I always tell people, you know, the difference between cattle and animal and humans, well, cattle contentedly munch grass in pastures and human beings discontentedly smoke grass in bars. <clears throat> and in that, you see the difference. You just, you know, you're born with this incredible complexity inside of you. Um, and you know, sometimes we, like I said, spiritually we haven't been served well because we've, we've, you somewhat be told this should be simple. You shouldn't be struggling in life. Or for instance, you shouldn't have an ego. You know, in, 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 uh, for, for most of us in Christian spirituality, the word ego is a bad word. Okay. God, it's great to have PhD students who can. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Raymond. <clears throat> you know, but egos, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't even mean it to be irreverent. When you look at great people, Mother Teresa, John Paul II, um, Martin Luther King, people. Did they have a great ego, a big ego? Absolutely, the size of the Grand Canyon. <clears throat> Doesn't mean they were egotists. They had huge egos, you know? And that's also why they did great things, you know? See, they were in touch with the godly energies inside of them. <clears throat> Except, you know, the difference between Mother Teresa and some big rock star is the rock star is in touch with this godly energy but oftentimes the rock star is identifying with that. <clears throat> Whereas Mother Teresa, she's a great person, she said, but this isn't me. I can do great things, but this is God. It's just, see, they're in touch with the energy. I want to see later on when I talk about the reticence of sensitive people. Most of us are never going to do great things. You know why? Because you're a really good, sensitive person. And you're so afraid of your own power that oftentimes we just become wallflowers. And the greedy wilts our willpower and our capacity to do things. <clears throat> but this is very important. The, the biggest struggles that come from our lives don't come from sin and don't come from original sin, which I want to talk about later. You know, as Christians, the way I was catechized, they said, you know, all of our trouble, the reason why we struggle so much in life is because of Adam and Eve and original sin. See, God made a perfect human being, Adam and Eve, and then they sinned, the original sin, they got thrown out of the garden, and since then, and that's true in all Christian religions, in fact, it's even stronger if you're a Protestant, you know, um, if you grew up in Protestant evangelical traditions who take original sin a little more seriously than Catholics. <clears throat> but we took it seriously too. Remember, we used to be baptized against original sin. And original sin, I'll talk about that, but that's not our deepest problem. The, the, the struggles we have with human nature doesn't come from what's bad in us. That's the paradox. The struggle you have as a human being primarily doesn't come from what's bad in you, it comes from what's good in you. It's the goddess in you with infinite appetites that make your life complicated. It's the divine in you with infinite appetites that makes life complicated. You know, it's interesting, atheists, when you read atheistic literature of the 20th century, the great atheists, so you can read Heidegger, you can read Jean-Paul Sartre, you can read Camus, you can read Schopenhauer and all these great atheists, Nietzsche. <clears throat> they had to deal with this and they don't know how to deal with it. They said there's no God and somehow life should make sense and they realize it can't make sense. And this, you're just too big for it. I'll give you a great image from Camus, Albert Camus, the great atheist writer. Albert Camus concluded this. This is the image he uses for humanity. <clears throat> and he used the image of a medieval prison. You know, in a medieval prison, what they used to do, they, they believed that they had to break the spirit of the man. Usually it was a man. If it was a woman, they just burned her so they, <laughs> at the stake. So. But when they tried to break somebody's spirit, what they do, they, they always built the prison too small. So imagine you're five foot eight, okay? They would make the, the, the cell only about four feet eight. So you could never stretch out and you could never stand up. See, so you always be stooped and always be curled and you can never go to your full stature and eventually it would break the person's spirit because you could never stand up straight. And Camus said, that is the human being in this life. 
<clears throat> you can never stand up straight. There's just so much energy inside of you. You want to fly. You want to be everywhere. You have all this thing, and you can't. And eventually, as happens to most people, you end up with a lot of depression or a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger. It's not easy for people to age into gratitude and to graciousness because of the disappointments and simply the fact of all the things in life and the dreams we'd like to have, and 98% of it can never happen, you know, because we're not God. We're human beings. But the trouble is we have godly energy inside of us. Limited human being in a limited place, limited situation with all this godly energy, it makes your nature really uh, complex, and it really strains your willpower. Okay, that's the first complexity. Um, we'll get to the second if this thing changes. Okay, <clears throat> there we go. Okay, our constellated energies within us that are imperialistic and difficult to bend. Let me get technical for a few minutes, you know. You know, Nietzsche, the, the great atheist, Nietzsche said, you know, um, and, and, and many of the great atheists, you know, the existentialists, they said, you know, that you can, we have to pick our meaning. You know, what, 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 what's meaningful to you? They say, well, they say, you know, as, you, as, as Christians, we say, well, that's prescribed for us. You know, as a Christian, you search for your vocation. You search for meaning. The meaning is out there. You have to find it. But if you don't believe in God, there's no meaning prior to you. You create your own meaning, and the atheists believe that you simply could do this. You know, you choose what's going to be valuable to you and so on. Well, Jung, the great psychologist, came along and he said, it doesn't work at all. And he said, the reason why it doesn't work, he says, um, he said, because we can't invent our own values. Why not? because they can't simply impose what they believe into our souls. That's quite a lie. You want to take that one home. You can't impose your beliefs into your soul. Your soul has its own, um, like Pascal said, the heart has its own reasons. Your soul has its own reasons. You know, if you ever want to read a, a frighteningly brilliant book, James Hillman, the philosopher just died a few years ago, he wrote a book way back in the 60s called Suicide and the Soul, okay? <clears throat> and he says, you know, and, and, and the book isn't so much in suicide, so the soul. And it's interesting, Hillman, who was an agnostic, you know, but probably wrote some of the best literature that's been written, it's certainly in the last couple of centuries, on the soul. So there is this atheist writing this great literature on the soul. And he said, you know why so many people commit suicide? He said, because the soul is stronger than the body. And sometimes the soul just has its way. He said, and our souls aren't listened to. He said, you know what, what happens in so many suicides? He said, the soul can't be heard and it kills the person. It's interesting, he has some advice for psychologists and for uh, the church. He said, you know what's wrong with religion and psychotherapy and medicine? He said, Religious people are always trying to save the soul, and psychologists and doctors are trying to fix it. He said the soul doesn't need to be fixed or saved. It's already immortal. The soul has to be listened to. And see, the soul has its own things. And that, that's what, if you've ever heard this expression, they call them archetypal energies. See, your soul, you don't, you're not born into this world just as a blank piece of photographic paper. And your parents socialize you, you learn English, you learn Spanish, you become a Roman Catholic or a Presbyterian, and you, you learn, and, and, and this makes, no. Your soul comes in, it's already got powerful, clear energies that you can't, you, you can't, uh, and those energies, not only can't you change them, they're very imperialistic. They're going to speak, and they're going to have their way, you know. And now, I don't have time to go into this tonight, but different analysts, so if you get people like, uh, for instance, those of you who are women, if you want to read uh, Jean Bolin, The Goddesses in Every Woman, or men, you to read like Robert, Robert Moore, Magician, Lover, Archetypes, or just read Jung, read Hillman, read all these people, and they say, you know, there, there's just clear energies in the soul that, that are going to have their say. So I'll give you an example. They say one of the archetypal energies in us, if you're a man, you're a hardwire to be a father. If you're a woman, you're hardwired to be a mother. 
And that energy is going to speak in you. And if you don't honor it, it's going to act out in some different way. You know? So I'll give you an example. And maybe it's a bad example, but it's a clear one. In the 1990s, I was teaching on different faculties. And those were the years where, you know, first don't get me wrong, there's a very healthy feminism that needs to be honored. There's also a stride in feminism. And those were some of the years of really stride in feminism, you know, where everything masculine was wrong, you know, and everything was stereotyped. And I remember teaching with a, with a sister, a nun, wonderful woman, but, but she was really a strident feminist. She believed, for instance, if you told her that women are hardwired to be mothers, she would have scratched her eyes out. She would have said, that's just men imposing this and so on. And you know something? She was the most motherly person I ever saw. <laughs> she just mothered her students, she mothered the faculty and so on. People would go into her class and say, this isn't the class. We're here to form community, to be with each other. At a university level, that doesn't work. It's a class. <laughs> you know, and some of the seminarians would walk out of her class and say, I'm not here. One seminarian told her, I have a mother at home. I don't need you. She threw him out of class. You know? It's wonderful. But if we don't act this stuff out for real, it's going to come out in, uh, or for instance, we're all hardwired to be what they call a magus, a magi. Remember the three wise men? which we always call the three kings. They're not kings, they're magi, maguses, you know. And notice, you know, so we're all hardwired to somehow be figures of wisdom, to instruct, to nurture, and so on. Um, have you ever met an, an anti-intellectual? Well, someone says, you know, all these intellectuals, that's all BS, and all these university profs, they think they're so full of themselves. What are you listening to? A university prof lecturing. You know, see, we can't escape those energies. They're inside of us. And also, they're imperialistic. They want you all, you know. Um, and that's why, and, and for instance, they compete with each other. So, for instance, as a man, one of my energies is to be a father, okay? One of my energies is to be a prophet, a warrior. But that doesn't mean just speaking prophecy. That means, for instance, your work. You know what happens a lot of times? You, be, you get into your work and you become a real bad father. Your work takes you over. Or you're really a good father, you're not a very good worker. <laughs> you know? Or for instance, as a woman, wife and mother are two different archetypes. If you're married, you're meant to be somebody's wife and you're meant to be somebody's mother, and they compete with each other. You know, a wife is not a mother, and a mother is not a wife. No man sleeps with his mother, he sleeps with his wife. You know, I know how many people have, men have told me this, you know something? I lost my wife the day we had our first baby. And after she became a mother, she was never a wife again. You can't even believe it. No, those are powerful archetypes. Or some people are, or a lot of women say, I lost my husband the day he got his first really good job. Because then he became a warrior, you know, and I lost my husband, and so on. See, those are powerful energies. And again, I pulled it because they impact your willpower, you know. <laughs> With the willpower, like I said, it's situated inside of a nature that's very complex. So you have all these fiery, godly energies, and at the same time, you, you have all these powerful archetypes that, that force you this way, that way, you know? So our freedom isn't this pure freedom that comes out and says, well, I'm just free to act any way I want. No. Um, your freedom is it's colored, it's pressured by, first of all, all these desires and restlessness and so on, then it's pressured by all these powerful archetypes inside of you. Okay. Then thirdly, because of that, we, we have a perennial struggle then, I said, between being too full of ourselves and too empty of God, between inflation and depression. <clears throat> Remember the first time I ever heard Robert Moore speak. It was at an auditorium in San Francisco. And he came out, he was a famous Jungian, and he said, um, he looked at the audience, we were about five or six hundred in the auditorium. And he said, well, he said, if you're here tonight, he said, there's a pretty good chance, he said, that you live, that you're a sensitive person and you live with a lot of chronic depression in your lives. He said, not clinical depression, chronic depression. And that's good. He said, because most people who aren't chronically depressed, he said, are idiots and jerks. And they're too full of themselves, you know. He said, most sensitive people, you know, you're so afraid of being a jerk an idiot, that you'd sooner be depressed and not get in touch with your energies. And he said, most people in touch with their energy, you wish they weren't. 
They're acting out. And he said, that's all we're going to talk about this whole week yet. How do you find that in between, you know, where you can act out and be fully your person and at the same time not be inflated and be an idiot and be a narcissist and a jerk? You know, it's a difficult thing. And so most sensitive people fight a lot with depression. And most sensitive people, we're not going to do a lot of great things in our lives because we're afraid of our own energy. You know, if you step on a stage, people, you're going you're to self-critique. Say, people are going to say, who does she think she is? God, I've done, you know, so you, you don't do it. You know, notice Mother Teresa was never afraid of that. John Paul was never afraid of that. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, they were never afraid of that. They'd step out and say that. You know, John Paul II said, he'd go in front of the whole world and say, I love you, and it's very important you hear that from me. You and I couldn't do that. Our tongue would break off. Imagine going front and I love you, and it's very important you hear that from me. You think they're going to say, who the hell does he think he is? <laughs> you know, see, narcissists have no problem saying that. Okay, they're too full of themselves. You and I are too empty of God. See, that's divine energy. And so we spend our whole lives fighting depression, inflation, inflation, depression, and so on. Um, and it's hard, and only great people get the right balance. That's what makes great people. That's what made Gandhi, what made Martin Luther King, John Paul II, Mother Teresa, these people. See, they were people who could absolutely get in touch with, with their godly energy, at the same time, not identify with it. And say, no, but this isn't me. You know, rock stars and some of our athletes and some people, they get in touch with their energy, but they also identify with it. Say, I am the king, and so on. And that's why there are a lot of times just huge problems in their lives. Kings have lots of problems uh, in many areas and so on. See, so our struggle is, and all of these things, they deeply impact our willpower. You know, we're not just these free agents walking around, and, well, I think I might decide this way, I think I might decide that way. It doesn't work like that. Okay, now, next one. Uh, our innate procl uh, proclivities... Um, Oh, I missed something here. I got this should go back. Sorry, I think I missed the slide here. Okay. Our, <clears throat> and that is our inability to, okay, if it's on your sheet, okay, it's not on the slide. Our inability to actually to fully actualize ourselves morally, our, naturally, our natural unwholeness of our nature. Okay, basically it's this. That this is a truism, but it's still meant to be, it needs to be said. You know, none of us are born, none of us are perfect. There are no perfect men, there are no perfect women, there are no perfect children, because there are no perfect people. We are born and simply, you know, Thomas Aquinas say, we're contingent for human, and no human being is perfect. So first of all, we, we simply lack um, wholeness, you know? And that is why none of us go through life without ever screwing up, without ever making mistakes, and so on. Um, we're not perfect. It's interesting, you know, you have in Scripture, and that's badly misunderstood, where Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Next time you hear that, say, how do you do that? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You can't do that. Because, you know, see, perfection means no flaws. A perfect complexion would have no flaws. You know, a perfect person would have no moral lapses. There are no people like that. So why does Jesus say that? He doesn't, okay? <clears throat> you know, if Aristotle had written scripture, we'd be in trouble, okay? Because we, when we hear the word perfection, <clears throat> excuse me, we th think in Greek software, you know. So for us, in all of our Western languages, perfection means no flaws. But that's Greek thought. The Bible, which is the New Testament, it's written in Greek, but it's Hebrew thought. And in Hebrew, the word perfection didn't mean not having any flaws. It meant compassion. So much so that in Luke's gospel, he simply ch changes it. Jesus says, be compassionate the way your Heavenly Father is compassionate. We can't be perfect, 
we can be compassionate. See, there is simply an unwholeness in our nature, you know, which is going to ultimately, if you're sensitive and honest, you're going to say like St. Paul, woe to me, wretch that I am, the good I want to do I can't do, the evil I want to avoid I end up doing. It's called being human. Then with that comes the effects of original sin. Okay, now, we, we <laughs> today, we don't really know, and I want to say this, and I can say it theologically. Today, there's the, the biggest issue in theology is, fine. what do we mean by original sin? I'm not sure how most of you, certainly I know most of you my age, you were raised in original sin. I think today it's not, it's not even taught anymore. But, you know, my generation were taught that God made Adam and Eve perfect man and woman, and they would have never died, and then they did this this original sin, and because of that, we fell from human nature, but that is why we're unwhole now. The human being is unwhole because of the original sin. Uh, that was a very powerful doctrine in all Christian denominations. And like even those of you who come from Protestant evangelical traditions, it's even stronger. Because remember, Luther was an Augustinian monk, and Augustine was the person who defined original sin for the Christian churches, and so on. And so we believe we're, we're flawed because of original sin. And I was raised on, a, on a, a spirituality and theology in which all of our faults are because of original sin. But I just told you earlier, our biggest struggles are not because of original sin, what's bad in us, it's because of what's good in us. Um, today, I want to quote Avery Dulles, who was one of the great theologians of our time, and, and a conservative theologian, so it's not some wild liberal who's saying this, but... Somebody, and incidentally, he was the son of John Foster Dulles, one of the great theologians with Jesuit. And um, it was interesting, he, he became a Roman Catholic, and his father, John Foster Dulles, whom the airport's named after, was very, very upset that his son would become a Catholic. But then later on, he became a Jesuit, and his father forgave him. He said, well, at least that's something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Roman Catholic is disgraceful, but at least you're a Jesuit. You know? okay, you're not dumb, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> but he was once asked in a conference in New York, someone says, Father Dulles, could, could you comment on original sin? And Avery Dulles has said, no. He said, because that particular dogma is in the repair shop as we speak, he said. <laughs> and when it comes out, I'll comment on it. But in fact, today we're moving closer and closer, this is a theological footnote, to the way would the churches teach original sin. They say original sin is a powerful, beautiful symbol that teaches three things that need to be taught. One of them is that there's evil in the world and God didn't put it there. See, there's evil, there's sin in the world, but it doesn't come from God. Secondly, okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Secondly, that we are helpless in that condition. We, we are helpless to actualize ourselves morally. And thirdly, that help we need has to come from the outside. It has to come from Christ. It has to come from a God from a power higher than us, which actually plays into what we're saying. It's the original sin. It's really a Christian symbol. And actually, the Adam and Eve story is a brilliant story. It's a brilliant story in which you can teach those three things to little kids simply by saying, once upon, except we don't say once upon a time. We say in the beginning, you know. Um, incidentally, let me explain that expression to you. In the beginning, what does that mean? <clears throat> and um, it means this. See, today, we think and we explain analytically, okay? So I'll give you a very simple kind of trite example. If you ask some university professor today in some school of whatever, uh, say, why don't chickens talk, okay? So this person would give you a whole scientific thing about they don't, they don't have any rationality, they don't have a voice box, and so on. That's why chickens can't talk. If you'd asked an ancient, why don't chickens talk, it always began this way. In the beginning, chickens did talk, okay? And then they would explain in a very clever story some catastrophe that happened in the chicken world that would kind of explain, and since then, chickens don't talk, you know? It's just a whole way of different, you know, these, these stories, they're true, but they're not literal. They're true, but they're not historical. The Adam and Eve eating the apple, did this happen? Yes, not historically. But it's true of the first man and woman. It's true of every man and woman who's ever walked this planet. You know, there's a reason why chickens don't talk. There's a reason why we aren't whole. 
Okay, so this is a very clever story that functions all kinds of levels. You can teach it to little kids, you can teach university professors. That, uh, um, but there's a reason why we're not whole. Okay, now, why are we not whole? Let's get, what, what was the original sin? You know, let's look at that story. God puts Adam and Eve into a garden, and he says, now you can do anything. You can do absolutely anything except one thing. See, in all great archetypal literature, you always have one condition. You can do anything except this one thing. You can eat from any, all the trees, all the fruit, everything's yours. And um, he said, except there's one tree in the center. If you take the fruit from that tree, that's the day you'll die. You'll know good and evil, and you're going to die. Okay. But then they're tempted by the devil. They eat the fruit. Then their eyes are opened. And, and um, they notice they're naked. They start hiding in the bushes, try to cover themselves with leaves. God comes down. He says, you know, uh, uh, do you eat the fruit? <laughs> And Adam said, it wasn't my fault. Okay, okay. <laughs> no. Now, what's that condition? And what, what's the... Well, for, first of all, those of you who know mythology, that comes from a much older myth. Many years before that story was written, the, the Babylonians had a creation myth called the Enume Lish, which this is already part of, you know, the tree of life and so on. But it's structured in this way. What's the condition? First of all, why does God make a condition, you know? We used to say, well, God makes this condition so you, you have to pay some price to go to heaven. You have to see whether you're obedient. No, that's none of this. God could not not make that condition, okay? It's a condition that's innate. It's a condition that's intrinsic, and this is the condition. You know, God made a love-oriented universe, which means the universe has to work by love, and then there's no such thing as unconditional love. Love has conditions that are a very part of love, and one of those conditions is this, that for it to be love, it has to be given freely and received freely. It has to be given as a gift, and it has to be received as a gift. If it isn't given as a gift, it's not love. If it isn't received as a gift, it's not love. Now, it's interesting that, that this story is written up very cleverly, so it, it almost sounds like it's a sexual sin, because they work out that motif of nakedness and so on. It wasn't. Remember, they were told to increase and multiply. God wanted them to have lots of kids and so on. But the sexual metaphor is there. This is really a metaphor for rape. That's what it is. It's a metaphor for rape. See, if sexuality is given freely and received freely, it's life-giving. If it isn't given freely or received freely, it's death-producing. You know. So basically, you put it this way. God puts him in the garden and says, I'm going to give you life. Underline the word give. I'm going to give you life, but you may never take it. As long as it's given to you and received as a gift, it's going to open up to you. As soon as you take it as old or somehow take it to yourself, you're, once you grab it, it's all wrong, and it's going to do all those curses. You know, Jim Mackey, the great Irish theologian, um, he, he wants to get, he gave a very clever example in reverse. He said, you know what, what, what the opposite of original sin is? He told the story from his own life. He said, you know, he said when I was a young man, he said, I once went hunting in Africa with some of my buddies. He said, and we were out camped in the jungle. He said, one morning I got up real early. I went out, he said, and I shot two wild turkey. I was very proud of that, you know. He said, and I'm walking back. Sun's just rising. He said, and I got these two wild turkeys strapped to my belt. He said, and then I became frightened because I realized somebody's following me. There was movement in the bush. He said, so I immediately grabbed my gun, looked around. He said, then I saw it was. It was a young boy, maybe 12, 13 years old. He said, naked, bloated belly. He said, and I realized what this young boy wanted was the food. He didn't want me. This kid was starving. He said, so as soon as I saw it, he said, I walked back. I opened my belt. The wild crane fell to the ground. He said, and the young boy ran up, but he wouldn't take him. He said, so Mackie said, I was telling him in English, you could have them, take them. But the boy couldn't understand English. He said, so he began gesturing to the boy, like, take him. But he said, the boy became agitated, and he just stood there, and he, was, he wanted something. He said, I didn't know what. He said, finally, the boy stepped back. He said, just opened his hands, and he stood there. He said, and he waited till I came and gave him the turkey. Then he ran off into the woods. See, that's the opposite of original sin. You know, he wouldn't take it. See, it has to be given to you. See, that's a condition that's innate. That's a condition within love itself. There's no such thing as unconditional love. 
you know, it can be offered unconditionally, but if it isn't received as gift, it's not a gift. If you want to give somebody a present, you walk up to them, they snatch it out of your hands, say, where have you been with that? It's no longer a gift. <laughs> okay. They just destroy it. That's the original sin, okay? And see what this great story in Genesis teaches us, that's an innate thing in us. You know, we, we tend to want to grab life. We tend to want to take it. We don't want to wait for it to come to us. Incidentally, as a footnote, that is the real meaning and the depth of the word chastity. Chastity isn't, first of all, a sexual thing. You know, chastity means the patience to wait till it's given. So it can be given as a gift and received as a gift. It's a powerful concept, you know, that um, you, you have to wait for it. And as soon as you think, you know, there's, there's an impatience, there's a taking that destroys gift, and so on. And um, <clears throat> I think today when we're in a society that's woke up finally with the Me Too movement, I think we're beginning to understand original sin. <laughs> that's what original sin is. It's, that's, you're taking the fruit. You're not waiting till it's given to you, you know. See, and that, that's inside of us. Um, then the third thing, this comes from our existential um, and that is that, um, you know, the poet Wallace Stevens is a wonderful poem. And inside he says, uh, he said, sometimes something happens to you, he said, and somebody scratches you just right. And he says, the terrible errors of childhood flow out and begin to play. Somebody scratches you just right, he said, and the terrible errors of childhood, you know, flow out of you. What he's saying is this. None of us come to adulthood whole. We have our wounds, and sometimes deep wounds, deep scars, you know, where we haven't been loved properly, haven't been honored properly. Maybe we've been abused. Maybe we have, you know, a sexual abuse or whatever is in our background. You know, those are what he calls the terrible errors of childhood. And if you're just scratched right, all of them begin to flow out, our angers and so on. Um, see, none of us get to... None of us get to uh, what we call the age of reason. Now, as a kid, they used to say in the catechisms, the age of reason was seven years old. I'd say, try like about 47, <laughs> maybe 57. Kind of, when do you kind of own yourself? A lot of times it takes years and years, you know? And, and, it, and then when you own yourself, then those, you get in touch with that, then you realize your mother did love your sister better than you. Okay, and you realize all the ways you weren't honored and so on. That's what Alice Miller, the great psychologist, called the drama of the gift of child. That at a certain point, it all flows into you. Wallace Stevens just puts it poetically, the terrible errors of childhood. Somebody scratches you wrong and it just all flows out, you know. Um, seeing that severely limits our freedom. That's our real existential, you know. See, you're a man or a woman like every other man or woman in the world. Okay, but you have a unique history. Your nature is the same, but your existential is very, very different. Maybe you had a wonderful, loving family, and because of that, you have a lot more freedom in you. Maybe you've been abused and abused and never treated right, and all kinds of, it makes a huge, huge difference, you know. Um, you know, when you look at some of the great people in our world, and I'm not afraid to name it. Take somebody like Jean Vanier. You know, Jean Vanier grew up, <clears throat> Jean Vanier is a great man. But also, he grew up, the, and, you know, it's enviable. First of all, he grew up, his mother and father are both saints. And his, his father was the governor general of the country. His mother was this wonderful, articulate woman, poet. He grew up, he had the looks of a movie star, and he was six foot six, and, you know, he was the intellectual. Well, he turned out to be a very, very nice man. <laughs> Who, who said, I've been gifted so much, all I want to do is spend the rest of my life giving it all back. How much different is that if somebody grows up and they're abused and misused and their body didn't turn out right and they didn't turn out right and they've been picked on and beat up in playgrounds and they grew up in poverty, you know. They're not the same. They're the same human being. They have a very different existential. Remember, this, there's a great line in the movie, Dead Man Walking, with Sister Helen Prejean, and she's visiting this Matthew Ponce sled, and he says, you know, Sister, he said, why are you living down here in the projects? He said, 
I've been before your dad. Your dad's a judge. He said, you grew up in a pretty privileged area. He said, why are you hanging out with us? He said, Matthew, that's the whole point. He said, I was given a lot. He said, now I want to try to give something back. You know, so, you know it's, he said, I've been given, John Vanya, Helen Prage, people had said, I've been given so much, I want to try to give something back. See, these people are freer than most of us who have been abused and victimized and so on that deeply impacts our freedom. Okay, one more thing before the coffee break, and that is, uh, oh, I went too far, we're there. Okay. This thing doesn't respond very quickly. In fact, it's not responding at all. Okay, now we're... Okay. Also, th this is what, what I call our proclivities to resist grace. You know, there's just some weird things in our nature. And I, I'm going to say weird, and that is, a lot of times, the very things we want, we lay all kinds of internal blockages to them. And, that, and that's partly in our nature, not just in our existential. So, well, for, first of all, the first one isn't so much, but the predisposition to want to do it for ourselves. You know, you see that already in little kids. As soon as the kid can tie his own shoelaces or hold his own spoon or fork, no matter how sloppy as he wants to, I want to do this, I want to do this. And instantly, that's the last thing you let go of. In the senior's home, the last thing you let go of is your freedom. To, I want to do this. I, I want, still want my car keys. I want to do this. Okay. Um, so a lot of that blocks what? Next. Our predisposition to resist the very love we desire. You know, it's interesting. This is where we're weird as a nature. The deepest instinct and deepest desire in all of us is for radical intimacy. And you know something? We push it off all the time. Let me give you a biblical example. You know, when Jesus, at the Last Supper, gets up to wash the disciples' feet, and he gets up to wash Peter's feet, now, probably Peter, more than anything else, that is what he desired when Jesus starts doing, he can't do it. He said, get away from it. Don't, you, you can't do this to me, you know? That's just the normal human resistance to intimacy, or even more powerfully, that powerful text that's in all four Gospels, where this woman is at Jesus' feet. You know, that's in all four Gospels. That's why it's a very important text. Scholars tell you when a text is in all four Gospels, it's a very important text, because even the birth of Jesus isn't in all four Gospels. Okay. Now, Jesus is at a house, and this woman comes in, and she breaks a jar of perfume, an expensive jar, alabaster, which would be a water for crystal, she wastes the jar. She pours the entire jar of ointment of expensive spiked dark perfume, expensive jar, expensive perfume, said, and the, the aroma filled the whole house. He said, then she began to cry on his feet and to dry his feet with her hair. You can't write imagery that's more raw than that. He said, you know what happened? Everybody in the house gets uncomfortable. They said, this shouldn't be happening. This shouldn't be happening. Everybody in the house is uncomfortable except Jesus. Jesus said, it should be. Remember he tells Simon, he says, this woman has just anointed me from my impending death. And he's not saying, you know, I'm going to be dead in a few weeks, so what the hell, let her waste his perfume. You know, <laughs> he's saying this, he said, no, when I come to die, I'm going to be more ready because tonight of all the nights of my life, I'm truly alive. This is what we live for, for this kind of expression of affection. And notice, he's the only person who could receive it. Everybody else is uncomfortable. And you and I would have probably been uncomfortable for there too, you know. And um, incidentally, <laughs> when he says, she has anointed me for my impending death, there's a second meaning to this, you know. It's very interesting. You know, if she had gone to his grave and done that, you know something? Nobody would have been scandalized at all. So you know what that means? I'm going to ask you this. When are you going to get the most compliments and most flowers of your whole life. <laughs> when you're dead. Then they're going to put flowers in your casket and they're going to say, God, she was a wonderful woman and we loved her and so on. Your whole life you didn't get the flowers. Nobody ever told you that. And now when you're dead, they do it. Jesus said, do it when you're alive. 
You don't put flowers on a dead person's grave. You put them on a live person's table, you know. And but notice we we have this innate resistance, you know. You know, and it, it's what we desire the most, and yet we push it off, and that's a powerful impediment to our freedom. And then lastly, uh, our predisposition to despair in response to our own helplessness. So that um, and you know, despair. I'm not talking about jumping off bridges here. That's an illness. Despair in this sense. I'll give you an example. Some years ago when I was still living in Toronto, okay, and the Globe and Mail in Toronto, the Globe and Mail is the liberal paper for the country. You know, we have two national papers in Canada. The Post is the conservative paper. The Globe and Mail is the liberal paper. So anyway, they have this Jewish writer, a woman in her 50s, and, um, and she, uh, she reviews books and so on. So one day she reviewed this book written by a young evangelical, and it was called Chastity for Jesus. So this young woman, she wrote this book. She said, like, she's a young evangelical. She's saving herself for a marriage. She believes in Jesus and chastity and so on. So this woman, who's Jewish, twice divorced, so on, is reviewing this book. So I was expecting a, a blast, you know. Oh, God, chastity for Jesus and so on. But actually she wrote a very good review. I said, you know, sis, I said, I can admire that kind of idealism. She says, I admire this young girl in our culture for her to write a book like this. And this woman said, and I have two teenage daughters, and I'm going to ask them to read this book. She said, I, I want them to have these kind of ideals. She said, because they're young. They should have ideals. She said, but it's very different. She said, if you're 50, twice divorced, and you don't know what you're living for. <laughs> no, it's just saying, like, I've already given up. <laughs> okay. See, if you're young and you haven't been, your life hasn't been shattered yet, then you should have, you should have ideals. But, you know, I'm 50, twice divorced. I don't know why I'm living. So, see, that's, that's a form of despair. You know, um, not Iris Murdoch. Um, anyway, great English writer. Her name slips to mind. She says, Doris Lessing she says, you know, she says, we should never call second best by anything other than its real name. It's second best. See, but at a certain sense, we start settling for second best. Well, that's all I can expect from life. That's despair. That's despair. That's practical despair and so on. And then lastly, the reticence of the sensitive. I kind of talked about that. You know, the more sensitive you are, oftentimes, the more precisely your freedom is going to be inhibited by your very sensitivity. So it's, who am I? They're going to think I'm full of myself. I can't do this. I'm the shy person and so on. Uh, that's wonderful in a way because you're never going to be aggressive. You're never going to hurt anybody. Um, but we're going to be filled with a lot of frustration. And our freedom is going to be deeply, deeply limited. You know, a lot of times, you know, our willpower is reduced radically by our own reticence. And, you know, precisely by our own sensitivity. You know, I should do this. I should step up, but I can't do this. Notice it's a failure of willpower. And it's, it's not because you're arrogant or whatever. It's the very opposite. You know, you're so sensitive that, hmm, I don't want to ruffle any feathers, I don't want to, you know, um, you know, that's what the psychologists call the pleaser, you know, sensitive people were born, you know, from the time they come out of the womb, it doesn't take them long to realize, I don't want to upset anybody, I'm going to get through life just by pleasing people and swallowing hard, you know, I'm never going to let my own needs known, you know, um, and that doesn't work really, because you know what happens when we don't do this, we start growing bitter and angry inside. You know, and the rage we so often feel is the rage of a sensitive person that's just had to always bide your time. You could never express yourself. You could never, you couldn't say no. You couldn't have your own will and so on. Um, and partly that's virtue, but partly it's not. Partly that leads to a lot of anger, a lot of rage. You know, somebody who says, you know, I'm just this little me. I can't do anything. That's never true. That's never true. A person like that, you'll always have some raging person underneath because you're not a little person. You've got the image and likeness of God. You've got fire inside of yourself, and that fire wants to come out. You've got all those powerful archetypes. They're going to act. And if you don't act, they're going to act. They're going to act out inside of you. That's what Jung and the people call your shadow and so on. Um, that just. You know, we have a very simple philosophy here with, the, with our continued education. If the lecture isn't any good, at least the cookies are, okay? <laughs> so.
So we provide you with great lunches, uh, not necessarily with good lectures. Be before we go into the second part and look at some of the, the anthropology of grace, the natural anthropology, again, this would be a good time to just stop and see if you have some questions, some comments, and feedback on this first part. So Sister Haw and uh, Raymond are going to be our two runners with the microphone. So if you have any questions or comments, objections, things you want, clarifications, dissatisfactions, whatever. Yeah. Thank you. I think that the, the way that you described original sin right now, even as old as I am, this is the first time that it's so clear that I can't tell somebody what original sin is and they understand me. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's interesting, we, tell you, we, we couldn't really teach this as Roman Catholics until into the 80s. I'll give you an example. No, no, I used to teach a course on original sin. <clears throat> and in 1967, so that's, I only began teaching a few years after that, the Dutch theologians, which was like Skillebex and Schunenberg and all that, they wrote a very famous book, called, which is very, still a very good book, called The Dutch Catechism. And in there, they tried to explain original sin in this way. And at that time, they got chastised by Rome. Rome said, you can't, you have to teach that we're somehow guilty and need to be baptized and so on. And then, um, that was the official Catholic teaching. And then Rome said nothing. And, and, and until, in, <laughs> in reverse, in, in 1980 or 79, so 10 years later, they came out with um, the revised thing for the RCIA. Okay, many of you work with RCA programs, and they have what they call the prenotande, which are all the instructions. And one of the instructions in there was simply stunning for Roman Catholics. They said, uh, this is Rome. They said, if somebody's in the RCA and they're not baptized, and they're going through, but they're dying of a terminal disease, you don't have to baptize them. They can go to heaven. You say, oh, what about original sin? <laughs> okay. Um, and then slowly, Rome began to say nothing about it and got into the 90s and the kind of, um, um, and it's unfortunate that, you know, we haven't been teaching it. You know why? Because we need that. Uh, we need some kind of doctrine. And so what, what happens today, since we don't have a doctrine of original sin, a theological one, we've developed some human ones. So you know what's substituted today for the doctrine of original sin? is all the literature on dysfunctional families and dysfunctionality, you know? See, my mom and dad said, the world's messed up because Adam and Eve ate an apple. Today we said, because we're dysfunctional. <laughs> and dysfunctional families, dysfunctional churches, dysfunctional. And there's the, that literature's good, with one exception, you know. That it's good in its analysis, but it seems to give you the impression that somewhere there are functional families. There aren't any. Okay. It's only a question of how bad is yours and how are you coping, you know. There are no whole organizations, functional churches. Every one of us is flawed. And I don't mean this sarcastically. It simply is. And see, we can torture ourselves with an ideal that doesn't exist. I used to work for a Holy Cross president, and he always says, perfection is the enemy of the good. It's a good line. Perfection is the enemy of the good. You can crucify the good with the perfect. Okay. It says, we are perfectly imperfect. Okay. Is there an anthropology of sin as there is an anthropology of grace? Yes, there's an anthropology of sin. You know, although we have to be, we have to be careful how we, you know, you know, you know today there's two extremes, you know, um, and, and that's the liberal and conservative extreme. I'm, I'm a pupil of Jim Wallace, and Jim Wallace says, you know, what's wrong with our theology and oftentimes our politics? He says, the conservatives get it, and they get it wrong, and the liberals don't get it at all. <laughs> That's, and, and sin is one of those things. See, so a lot of liberals say, we're not going to talk about that, and it's, you can only use this functional language and so on. Um, they're not getting it. Conservatives get it, but then conservatives start laying sin all over the place. Mortal sin and so on. And um, Well, first of all, in, 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 in a good theology of sin, you know, First of all, you can never tell from the outside. You can never say that's a sin. You can say that objectively that's wrong. That's something different. That's sin. Um, you can never objectively, and, and, and that's classical Roman Catholic morality, you know. You can never say that's a sin. So, for instance, can you say, we used to say, if you, if you miss Mass on Sunday, it's a mortal sin. If you have sex outside of marriage, it's a mortal sin. You can't say that. You can say that, uh, you know, 
you shouldn't be doing that or you should be doing this, but you can never say it's a mortal sin. Um, like for instance, today, let's use the, the question of mass and sex, you know, which used to be the clear. You miss mass on Sunday, it's a mortal sin. You, you have sex outside of marriage, it's a mortal sin. You know, um, boy, there'd be a lot of mortal sin around, <laughs> you know. Our kids, you know, no. You know, mortal sin by definition means that you're alienated from the family, you're alienated from God. A lot of times they're not alienated at all. They're just lazy or they're just, you know, uh, making bad choices and so on. So that you really believe that, you know, I'll give you an example. I once did a funeral, a very sad funeral. A young guy, he was in his 20s, Catholic kid from a Catholic area and to a little hometown where I came from, you know, everybody Catholic. And this was a young guy and he was living with his girlfriend and he wasn't going to church and he gets killed in a car accident, you know. So I'm saying mass and you got this sense people are scared. This guy's going to go to hell. He must be in hell, you know. And afterwards, his aunt said at the reception, she says, you know, God, she said, he was such a good kid. If I were running the gates of heaven, I'd let him in. <laughs> What's she saying? You know, see, God is not as compassionate and understanding as we are. You know, we understand kids. They're kids, you know. Um, you know, God, <laughs> you know, we, we got to be really careful with the word sin. And we need it. We need it. There is such a thing as sin, you know. And if you don't believe it, just watch the news every night. And uh, No, there is real sin, uh, but we have to be careful how we apply it. And, that, and Jesus himself says, you can't judge. How often Jesus says, don't judge. Don't judge. He said, that's God's job. You know, uh, just be grateful that nobody's judging you and so on. So he says, just leave it. Leave it in God's hands. Now, we still need to... Uh, um, we need to teach sin. Sin is real. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, just watch the news and you see that there's a lot of bad in our world. Um, but we have to be careful how we apply it. And I think liberals tend to miss it and don't want to use the word, you know, or like sometimes you have liberal friends that say, you should never use the word should. It should be stricken from vocabulary. It's nonsense. There's a lot of things. You better do them. <laughs> okay. You should do them. You know, you might not. It's not necessarily a sin. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give you a very simple one. My moral theologian, way back, used this, and it's still a very clear example. He said, imagine this. And that's the difference between something that's wrong but not necessarily a sin. He said, imagine this. Imagine you have, those of your parents or grandparents, imagine you have a six-year-old granddaughter, and you're an artist, and you're working in your basement, and you're making something with mosaic glass, so this little girl decides she's going to be helpful. She goes up to your cabinet and breaks about 10 of your best crystal glasses and brings them out and says, here, Grandma, some more glass for you to work with. Did she do bad or good? No, she did something bad objectively. Those glasses are broken. She did something good intentionally. See, it, it, and what, what an example, I guess, a very simple example, it shows you how complex there's different things working there, you know? So you don't know whether to kill her or to kiss her, you know. Uh, you know she meant well, and, but she did something stupid, you know. Um, that's a lot of stuff. A lot, lot of the, in, in the world, there's a lot more stupidity than there is sin. Okay. I'm wondering if the archetypal energies m might encompass the Enneagram types that Rohr and others talk about. Or are those learned things? Yeah. It's a very good question. He says whether archetype of energies encompass like Enneagram and also other topologies. Yes. You know, like, I mean, that you'd have to work at drawing out the connections. But because, you know, reality is one. And there's one set of wisdom. See, these, these are different softwares of getting at it. Um, you know, Sandra Schneider, who's actually going to speak here during our cup, some years ago I went to a conference and she was brilliant. Because Sandra is also a philosopher. And she said, if you take the four transcendental properties of being, of God, pardon me. Remember, I'm sure you know them off by heart. <laughs> no, what, what, what's the four things we can say about God? We say God is one, true, good, and beautiful. Those are the four transcendental properties of reality. Reality is one, good, true, and beautiful. See, in all the archetypes and all the topologies and stuff spin off that, you know, and um, so that, you know, 
some people have done that kind of interconnection work. Now, I can't do it for you here tonight, but, you, but I can say for sure those things connect. You know, that, you know, and maybe that's a thesis for somebody to, to take archetypes and then, you know, show how other topologies split off that. Father Ron, I liked your presentation very much tonight, but I, here is the challenge for you. To see if we could incorporate the issues of willpower and grace into our democracy at the moment. I, I don't like where you're going with this. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> let, 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 let me take refuge in philosophy, you know, and that is, that is our existential, you know. See, remember when I made the distinction between nature, you're a person, you're a man or a woman, but you're not living in, in a vacuum. You're not living in the abstract. You're living in this situation and today, United States, you know, um, we're living in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a powerfully polarized situation in which it's hard for us to be civil to each other. It's hard for us sometimes to be at the same converse that table. Sometimes families, there's just a lot of topics you can't talk about and so on. That is our existential. And, and notice it's, it's very delimiting of our freedoms, you know. Um, I'm not free to say what I want right now, <laughs> and neither is anybody else, and so on. No, so that uh, no, that's, it, that's a good point. That is our existential, you know. That that's um, um, so we're see in, in the past, you know, you, you've heard the word existentialism, you know. See in in the past, Christian philosophy and Christian theology, that was our weakness. It was also our strength. We were so much what we call essentialists. We talked about human nature and just human beings in the abstract as if we didn't live any place, you know. And a lot of that had real implications in terms of, an you know, example, like uh, when the Europeans came to the Americas and all the imperialism and stuff, that they weren't bad people. We didn't know any better, you know. We came over and thought, this is the way we teach Christianity, you know, and so we taught European Christianity, we didn't teach Christianity. We went to Asia, some of the people like Francis Xavier and some of them were a little more alert. They said, no, no, this is Europeans, Chinese don't think like that, and so on. But see, so we didn't know any better, we didn't consider the situation. Always thought, this is the truth, and as if we're all living in, in a vacuum, but we're not. But today, you know, <laughs> we need a couple of hours on your question, you know. Um, no, it's, it, we're living in a, in a painful situation in the United States right now. Not just the United States, it's pretty true most all over the world. You know, um, we're not so unique, you know. You know what happened in the Muslim world already about 25 years ago? Al-Qaeda said, let's make Islam great again. That's what, that's what ISIS is, you know. It's all over the world. That's what Brexit is. That's what all these things are, you know. And you can agree or not agree. It's basically, um, we're, we're, this is happening all over the world. That um, and, and, and the real culprit isn't one election or isn't Donald Trump or whatever. You know, you know what's behind all, what's the tension? It's globalization. We are living through a time where the world is globalizing and it's simply frightening and leaving a lot of people behind. And, you know, people who lived through the Industrial Revolution, they didn't say, you know, it's pretty painful, I'm living through the Industrial Revolution. Historians tell you that afterwards, you know. We're living through a revolution that makes the Industrial Revolution look like Walt Disney, you know. And it's just, like, things are changing so fast. They're changing so fast. And also we have a generation, we become a generation where, let me word this carefully, where we're not stable enough anymore to be flexible. You get that? You know. To be flexible, you gotta first of all be stable. And we're not a stable enough society anymore to be flexible, so, so globalization is just driving people to the two sides of the spectrum, you know? And, um, and what you have is what we see in the news every night. Um, you know, see, you have to be stable to be flexible. I'll give you a great line from Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr said, you know, I grew up in Kansas. He said, and I grew up German, German uh, immigrant, Roman Catholic, Republican, 
He said everything was laid out, solid, absolutely conservative. He said, you know something? He said, it's the greatest gift you can have. He said, now I'm free for the rest of my life. <laughs> it's really true. If you were given deep roots as a kid, it's the greatest gift you can have. I grew up like that. You know, and after all, nothing scares you. I work with young seminarians who are wonderful, but they've never had stability in their whole lives. And so everything frightens them. You know, and, and be careful, that's Protestant and that's this and so on. Um, you know, they haven't had the stability, you know. And, and those of you who come from long Catholic traditions in Mexico or Ireland and so on, you know, be grateful that you're stable, <laughs> you know. In fact, when I was a kid, we used to joke, said, we have pathological stability, you know. <laughs> um, sometimes we'd be given a finger for a healthy distraction, you know. But you know something that's a great, we were always safe. We were always grounded, you know. And, um, but today our world is changing so fast. And see, globaliz and globalization is this. Um, let me give you just, this may be a bad example, but I think he's speaking for millions. Some years ago there was a picture for them the Atlanta Braves called John Rucker. And he, he, he wrote once in Sports Illustrated, he said, you know, we went to New York to play a basketball, a baseball game. He said, and I was on the subway, and I looked around and said, oh my God, he says, we have all these languages and all these colored people. He said, who let all of them into our country? It's not a bad guy. See, notice, uh, basically, I grew up and it was white and English. <laughs> and now it's not white and it's not English. Uh, that's frightening, you know, for white people who are English, you know, and uh, and I say this sympathetically, you know, or it doesn't matter what, whatever your color of skin and your language and so on, but the world now, your neighbors are every color and every language and every religion and so on, um, that that's getting used to. I'll give you a story from my own life. I was a Saskatchewan farm kid. I grew up, we were white, we were English. And we were Christian, you know. I never met a black person till I was ordained. And I went, and I, my first year I lived in San Francisco, and I was chaplain at a youth hostel while I was studying. And I met all these kids, and I got to befriend these two young black women from Detroit. Nice story. And they were sitting in my room one night, and one says, You know, Father said, You're a racist. I said, No, you're a nice racist. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, You're a racist. And she said, because, you know, she said, you're, you're trying too hard, first of all. She said, but you're not as comfortable with us as you are with white folk. And I said, it's true. I said, give me a chance, okay? Um, you know, but see, through the years, you know, I've had to grow a long ways, you know. Um, in fact, one of, the, one of the great compliments I've ever had in my life to close this story off was a few years ago after we started this Sankofa program, and this guy used to be president of university in San Francisco. Um, he's since died, wonderful man, one of the black uh, elders on our. And he was sitting with me one day and he says, you know, God, he said, you're comfortable with black people. How did you ever get to that position? <laughs> and I said, let me tell you a story, okay? <laughs> you know, see, but that's what's happening. It's not just with black, white, or Spanish and English and so on. It's just the world is globalizing to a point where it's just a lot of people can't cope with it, the same as they couldn't with the Industrial Revolution. It's just destabilizing a lot of people. And today, we're experiencing it in spades in this country, just in the anger and the polarization and so on, and, uh, and what's happening between, you know, Kavanaugh and, and, uh, and Ford right now is just all a symptom of that, you know? Um, okay, next time ask me an easier question, okay? Okay, <laughs> okay let, let, let's do a little bit more. Um, so we want to do an anthropology of grace. Um, and I'll have to roll this pretty fast here. See, theologically, grace is God's gift of God's self to us. We used to say God's gift of himself to us, but you can't say himself. <laughs> God giving God to us. In common language, we understand grace this way. As a higher power, we call it the supernatural, which can infuse, energize, and empower our natural selves. That's kind of grace. See, we have our natural selves with all our existential and our... But sometimes we experience something gets inside of us and it can lift our hearts. It can lift our spirits. It can make us stronger. It can make us do noble things and so on. That's grace, you know. Um, those of you who come from 12-step programs and where they say that, you know, um, you know, you need to 
the higher power, you know, you can name it God, but it's anything that gets inside of you that, that, um, that, that lifts you up, you know. God, if I want to get real schmaltzy, we could say, get Bep Mettler here to sing, you know, about your wings. What was that famous song? You are the, 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 the wind beneath my wings. That's actually a beautiful song of grace, you know. Natural grace, you know, you know, you lift me up, you know. Um, now, I said this is commonly conceived of in a religious way. You know, we always talk of grace in church circles, in religious circles and so on. And we had a language for it, sanctifying grace and so on. But I want to talk to you about grace outside of religion. Okay. That, um, see, <clears throat> there's grace outside of religion. It's the same grace but we experience grace outside of explicitly religious understanding of us and their distinction. We always talk about there's natural, there's supernatural, there's religious, there's secular, that just blurs. Let me give you an example or several examples. You know, you can go into a church. You go into a really beautiful church. Go to a major cathedral in, in Chartres in France or something. You walk in and say, wow, it's beautiful. It kind of lifts your spirit. But you can look at a sunset, and what's the difference between the sunset and the church? You know, a few years ago, when I was on sabbatical in, in, uh, with the Trappists in, <clears throat> in Colorado, one day Bill Ritter, who was the governor of Colorado, was a friend of the Albany's, <clears throat> he took me and my brother and took us for about a six-hour boat ride down the Colorado River on a beautiful Saturday morning, just perfect weather, and there's not a soul there for about six hours. I thought, this is the greatest cathedral I've ever been in. You know? See, that's grace. It lifts your spirit. It infuses. It makes you a better person. You know? You don't want to come out of there and hit somebody. <laughs> you want to come out and help somebody. See? But see, that's where the distinction between natural and supernatural blurs. You can have that experience in a church. You can have that experience in nature. You can have to experience in love and so on. And we'll talk about, see, that, that, that grace that, that lifts us up, the higher power isn't just church power. It is, it isn't just, it is God, but, but God also works through the natural. Okay. I said, that's where the natural and the supernatural flow into each other. Thomas Aquinas coined a great phrase we've used ever since. He said, grace builds on nature, you know that nature and grace at a certain point, you can't tell phenomenologic, this is nature, this is grace, and so on. It's just, you know, um, it's like two people. If two people are really deeply in love, and that's empowering each other, and you say, which is coming from which side? Y you don't know. It's the, the two together make something else, you know? See, so nature and the supernatural, they flow together, and um, it makes for grace. We don't call it grace, you know? Most people don't call nature a church, although some people do. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, my church is to go into nature. You know, my church is to go into the woods. My church is to go to the mountains. Other people say, my church is to go into a cathedral. They're both churches, you know. One is more explicitly religious. The other one can be very deeply religious, except we don't call it religious, okay? And I want to give you a line there, which <laughs> actually I'd like to give the whole talk just on that line. You know, Jesus tells us that. Jesus says, remember, all good things come from God. That's quite a line. All good things come from God, which means God is the author of everything that is good. Okay? And you're going to see, and grace flows from that. You know? And classically, in spirituality, and today oftentimes in churches, we don't make that distinction. You know, when we make distinctions like, this is secular, this is sacred, this is religious, this is profane. Um, no. Let me stretch you with that. If all good things come from God, that means God made Mother Teresa's virtue, okay? He also made the teeth and hair structure of, of George Clooney. <laughs> or Julia Roberts, or wherever your favorite movie star is. You know, that beauty comes from God. Only God makes good things, you know? God married, made Jerry Seinfeld's humor, you know? If it's funny, it's wonderful, it comes from God. There's only one author. You know, some, well, he's not religious, he's Jewish. No. <laughs> Give you an example. I was living in Rome in 2004. 
And that's when the Olympics were in Greece. Remember that the Olympic Games were in Greece? And today the Olympic Games are the ultimate beauty pageant of the planet. You know, it's not Miss America or Miss World. Today, the real beauty pageant is the Olympic Games. You have the most powerful, youthful, athletic, and oftentimes attractive bodies in the whole world. And they're in $10,000 spandex besides, you know? <laughs> And so I remember watching, the, you know, they're watching, they make this Olympic, you know, they're walking out with their flags and all these beautiful young people and so on. And I was sitting with some cynical old priests. <laughs> they were saying, oh, God, that's all commercial and that's all, you know, networks and this is all about steroids and so on, part of which is true. Um, but what's wrong with that reaction? Your first reaction to beauty shouldn't be, well, this is this and that, you know. You say, no, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Afterwards, you can say, well, there's steroids and so on. See, your first reaction, you have to honor it. Remember, this is a strong statement. You know who Camille Paglia is? She's this maverick feminist that nobody likes. Even the feminists don't like her, you know? <laughs> and she's a lesbian and so on, but she is brilliant. And I saw her on television once, and she said, you know, uh, and she is a strong feminist. She said, you know what's wrong with so many of these feminists? Just Gloria Steinman or, or, or you know, so on. She said, she said, well, she said, I'll tell you what the problem is. She said, they're all women in their 50s and 60s, um, and said, who have done great things. They have doctorates and so on. She says, and they can't accept the fact that when a 17 year old girl walks in this room, that there's more sheer power in that 17 year old body than all your doctorates. She said, and they'd like to change the rules as if they could. She said, but they're wrong. She said, you don't. She said, you have to honor that beauty because it's real. And it's, it's transient. It's going to pass away soon enough. Now, she's not speaking as a Christian, but you can say it as a Christian. You have to honor beauty, truth, humor. Whenever you see it, don't say, well, it's just secular. There's no such thing as just secular. All good things come from God. If, some, if Jerry Seinfeld is funny, you know, or Larry David is funny, that humor comes ultimately from God. If a movie star is beautiful, that be beauty comes from God, you know. Um, if somebody is, is brilliant and they in the event Microsoft and they invent, you know, um, Facebook and so on, that intelligence comes from God. It doesn't mean the person is religious or whatever. All good things come to see. And that, that's natural grace that needs to be said. Those of you who are in 12-step programs, um, remember you work with the higher power. But the higher power can be Jesus Christ. It can be the Holy Spirit. It can be God the Father. It can be Allah. It can be Buddha or whatever. Or it can simply be the, the things I want to say in a few minutes. It can be love. It can be beauty. It can be truth. It can be family and so on. You know, some years ago, uh, if you can still find that book, it's wonderful. Peter Berger was a sociologist of religion. He wrote a very famous book way back in the early 70s or late 60s called A Rumor of Angels. I was a young university student, and I remember just being blown away with this book because I've been raised in this wonderful Catholic traditional stuff, but you know where grace is inside of churches. And see, Berger wrote this book, A Room of Angels, and he said, like, in everything, you know, for instance, he says a chapter on finding God in laughter. And I remember being struck by that. He said, you know, when people can laugh, it's a sure sign of the transcendence. You know, people can laugh in every situation which shows they're above the situation. Thomas More told a joke to the guy who was going to cut his head off a minute later, you know, that shows there's something <laughs> transcendent in his spirit, you know. And he says, so in ordinary life, this is a really powerful book, he says, just the, the experience, for instance, one of his powerful expressions, he says, you know, when a mother gets up to, to, for a crying child at night, so a child wakes up, okay, and the child's crying, the child is scared and its imagination, darkness, and so on. So this mother is, you know, consoling his child, and she's pat patting it and saying, you know, it's all right, don't be afraid, we're all here, turns the light on, tells the child, don't be afraid. So that mother is saying the creed. You know, she's telling the child, so what? basically she's saying, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Said She's not saying it explicitly, so the mother can say, she's saying the creed. Otherwise, because she's telling the child, it's all right. Trust it. There's light here. There's love here. See, it's not happening at church. It's grace. It's deep grace. You know, when you say the creed on Sunday, that's what you're doing. You're scaring away all the monsters and all the dark and everything else. Saying, 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. It's going to be all right. Julian of Norwich, in the end, all will be well, and all will be well, and every manner of being will be well. That's what we're saying with the creed, you know. If you console somebody, or, you know, a mother consoling a child, you're consoling somebody at a funeral. You're consoling somebody who's hurt, somebody whose heart is broken. So it's okay. Every time you say it's okay and you mean it, you're saying the creed. See, he said, those are the rumors of angels. He said, they're, they're all over, okay? Carl Rahner said, you're always seeing, seeing um, ordinary life, like what he calls, against an infinite horizon. You think you're just seeing, you're always seeing it beyond, beyond, you know? Now, we see that in their everyday experiences, you know? You know, there are everyday experiences, which we all experience, which simply, notice we said grace is anything that empowers you. It infuses you. It gives you some extra energy. It makes you want to be a better person. Well, lots of things do that. Love. There's no more powerful cocaine to cure something on this planet than falling in love or having a faithful love, you know. Um, it's just that moves the heart, sometimes a lot more than when you're sitting and praying, you know. It's grace or family and community. You know, um, when they say family is domestic church, you know, today a lot of people don't go to church. If you're with a family, you're still going to church, you know. Sartre used to say hell is the other person. He's completely wrong. Hell is complete aloneness. As long as you cling to community, family, and so on, you're, you're inside the Trinity. Remember when John, when Paul, not Paul, John, in the Gospels or the first epistle, the thing we always read at weddings where it said, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in that person. And we always romanticize that, which is nice too, but it's not a romantic text. In Greek it says, God is agape. And whoever abides in agape abides in God, but you can translate it this way. God is family. God is the sharing of existence. God is community. And as long as you stay inside of community, as long as you stay inside of family, you are living the life of the Trinity. That's the Christian God. Remember, we don't believe just in God the Father. We believe in the Trinity. There's a Father, Son, and Spirit. There's a flow of life. You know, whenever I preach on Trinity Sunday, I always tell people, you know, today, the Trinity, don't try to understand this. Don't try to go home and pick up triangles if you're Irish or a shamrock or whatever, you know, and figure three and one, one and three, and so on. No. I said, Trinity is, is, is meant to be experienced. Buckminster Fuller said, God is as much a verb as a noun. Okay. He said, you want to understand the Trinity? Go home today, get your family or friends together, get three good bottles of wine, and just let it flow, you know. <laughs> the Trinity, you know... Basically, you're inside the flow of life, you know. See, that's grace, and it empowers you, you know. Um, you know, Gutierrez, the famous liberation of theology, it comes from him, so he's not going to give you an easy buyout, you know. Um, he always says, you know, always do the things that keep your heart mellow. So especially if you're working for justice, the last thing you want to do is to get angry. So he said, drink wine do stuff. He said, stay with friends. Do the type of things that keep your heart warm. See, they basically, he say, keep your heart in grace. You know, if you're doing it from willpower. It, that's exactly the older brother. We saw that last week. The older brother, the prodigal son. I stayed home. I'm doing all the work. I hate it, but by God, I'm doing it. You know, see, there's no grace there, you know. He should have a bottle of wine. Loose them up a bit, you know. I want to tell you a story of my own life. I went to the seminary when I was very young, and I was in a pretty conservative, good, but very conservative, and we were really strict, you know. I look at seminarians today and say, been there, I've got that T-shirt, you know, <laughs> where everything is strict and you're scared, afraid of the secular world. And so for the first, there were two years, we couldn't go home, you know. Then finally, you know, after my second year in philosophy, we got to go home for a week in summer. So I'm home, and my mother had to be the most Christian woman ever, and I was scandalized at her paganness, you know. So one night I came in, and my mother's watching, laughing. Goldie Hawn and Lily Tomlin and so on. And I was pretty, you know, I'm a young seminarian. We're into God. And I was scandalized. I said, you watch that? 
I said, that's pretty pagan. And she said, look at me, she says, she makes me laugh with the implication, you don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. It was good. You know, she's saying, this makes me laugh. It lifts my spirit. This is grace. You don't have that language. It's grace. And I realized how uptight and rigid and how much like the older brother I was getting, how judgmental and so on. See, love, family, community, beauty. See, that inspires so many artists. Remember, it's one of the transcendental properties of being. God is one, true, good, and beautiful. And there's artists, they'll sacrifice their life. They'll die of martyrdom for beauty. It's grace, you know. Um, see, that it's interesting. Um, Confucius, who may have been the greatest pedagogue ever alive, you know, Confucius said, always teach by beauty. He said, you know why? He said, beauty is the only thing you can't argue with. <laughs> you, you can't argue with beauty. He was only wrong about one thing. You know what else you can't argue with? You can't argue with a baby. And that's why God was born as a baby. Start arguing with the baby, it just starts crying. It's all over, you know. And so that's why God came into this world as an infant that you can holler at and so on is just... Uh, that's when we showed at God like Job, you know, where in the hell are you and I'm suffering and so on. No answer. Staring like a baby. And sooner or later, that moral power gets to you. But beauty is like that. Beauty can't be argued with. And beauty inspires a lot. You know, no, I mean, it inspires all of us. Sunsets, nature, anything beautiful and so on. But um, we're not necessarily natural artists. Natural artists, that it's, it's, it's their religiosity, you know. And you have martyrs for art, the same as you have martyrs for God, and so on. And martyrs for art are pretty well martyrs for God, because remember, beauty is one of the properties of God. Okay. And then duty. You know, it's interesting. You know, what, what, what's a great grace for a lot of people? Their work. Just their work. You know, you know that, that they, they, their, their, their work, which, which ties to a sense of their vocation, you know, I'm a father, I'm a mother, I'm doing this work and so on, which ties then to a sense of fidelity, you know. And a man told me once, he says, you know, he says, I have, he said, I'm a married man, he says, and I was, my younger, he said, I was so tempted to affairs. He says, you know what, what kept me? He said, my own kids, my wife has looked, he said, I can't do this to them. I just can't do this to them, you know. See, it's grace. His love for his children, his love for his wife. He says, you know, you, you know, um, see, or, or some people, just their work. Their work sustains them, you know. Um, it's grace. Or noble ideals. Um, a, a lot of people <laughs> are inspired by an ideal, and, and that ideal lifts them up. I want to jump a slide ahead here. And I uh, want to give you one more. Okay, this is a quote actually I took from Jordan Peterson, his book on, uh, he says, Socrates rejected expediency and the necessity of manipulation that accompanied it. He chose instead under the direst of conditions to maintain his pursuit of the meaningful and the true. 2,500 years later, we remember his decision and take comfort in it. What can we learn from this? We can cease to utter falsehoods. And, living according, and live according to the dictates of your conscience. You can maintain your nobility, even when facing the highest of ideals. You will, you will be provided with more security and strength than will be offered by any short-sighted concentration on your own safety. If you live properly, fully, you can discover a meaning so profound that it protects you even the fear of death. You know, Socrates believed in this ideal of truth. Just like Jesus, he was condemned to die didn't bother him at all. And they said, you know, if you renounce this, you die a martyr for truth. He said, we'll save you. He says, no, I believe this. And, you know, see, it's grace. They don't say, well, Jesus died in grace and Socrates died with high ideals. <laughs> he died in grace, you know. Um, and then on your sheets, you know, another, another thing that's healthy is healthy pride. 
healthy pride can be a great form of grace. You know, it's just say, our family doesn't do this. I don't do this. You know, that's healthy. That's pride. Pride doesn't, pride can be bad. Pride can also really be good. You know, you know, you know what, you know what's one of the first sense, uh, signs of clinical depression? People lose their sense of all pride. They don't even care what they look like anymore, you know. But there's something healthy and grace giving in being proud. Proud of your body, proud of who you are. Say, I don't do this. Our family doesn't do this, and so on. Uh, I'll tell you a great story on this. Uh, when, when I grew up on the Saskatchewan farm, and so on, and we had some of one of our neighbors, and they were a little more affluent, a little more educated than the rest of us, but also they were a very good family. And they would do all these wonderful things for the community, and they build the curling rink, and did all kinds of stuff for you. And we always looked up to them, you know. And one day, one of them was sitting at my brother's table, and he made a very racist remark, you know. And now my brother could have jumped him and said, well, that's racist. He said the opposite. He said, you know, he said, Ed, that surprises me. He said, you know, your family, God, you have so much class. I, I'm amazed you'd say something like that. And immediately I said, I'm sorry. He said, God, I'm stupid. He said, I know. See, he called him to his ideal. He said, you know, you're this wonderful, classy family. You're too classy to be a racist. And, and, and the guy said, it's right, it's right, it's just stupid. He said, you get in these conversations, you do dumb things and so on. See, he had a healthy pride. My brother didn't call him to some religious ideal. He called him back to a healthy pride. He said, your family is a classy family. You know, you don't do this stuff. <laughs> and he immediately recognized him. We don't, we don't. It's stupid, you know. So pride, and then lastly, laughter. Um, and she, laughter is, is the... It's just a wonderful, transcendent quality. There's a powerful grace in laughter. Uh, and see, laughter sets you above any situation you're in. You know, you can be facing the executioner like Thomas More. If you can make a joke of it, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not going to die bitter and so on. See, that la laughter, is a, laughter is just a great, great grace, and it's an underrated thing, you know.